Yeah, I have been working on feature store for, I mean, at least two to three years. So I'm actually getting tired of speaking feature store. But, uh, but today, actually, I'm, I'm again very excited to talk about uh, the project uh, we do internally. Uh, and we want to share the experience uh, how we build a feature store uh, using Fist. A little bit more about myself like, uh, I work in the core ML team inside Robinhood. Yeah, and I mostly in charge of the serving stack, like feature serving and the model serving. Uh, and for this talk, we will be focusing on the on the feature part. So before we go into the technical detail, uh, let's ask, uh, ask a, a, a question. Like, do we really need a feature store in uh, our organization, right? Uh, because when we propose such project to leadership, you cannot just tell them, uh, yeah, I read a blog post and it says like every machine learning team need a feature store, right? While this statement might still be true, uh, we decided to build a feature store uh, from first principle. Um, so one important like rationale we have is feature is so important uh, to a machine learning model. Um, and we certainly need some infrastructure to, to help us to manage them. Uh, and, uh, and also we noticed there's some communication costs between data scientists and engineers when they try to bring their features online. And there's some more additional part like um, uh, questions we want to adjust, like how do you guarantee the correctness? How do you do monitoring alerting uh, when the feature changes? So with this question in mind, um, I also want to talk about like what we were at before. Um, so uh, th this diagram that uh, shows like um, before we have the, uh, this uh, feature store project. Um, so a data scientist, um, with in charge of the feature extraction, the uh, pipeline. And um, also the data scientists would be in charge of the, the model training because they are the one who build the feature. They know the business logic uh, way much better. So they build a model. And then after they, they have the model, uh, they would uh, also uh, uh, bring up some model servers. Uh, and that's the place where the product team will send requests to. And, uh, before the feature store project, um, the product team actually need to write uh, some kind of loading job because um, when data scientists extract the features, they would put the feature in a hive table. And product team, uh, which is mostly I, I'm referring to engineers, they, they write to uh, this uh, PySpark job to load the features into Redis. And then um, they, they would write a client code because they, they, they are the owner of the server. Um, and in the client, they actually would concatenate both the features from Redis and some other additional one that's not available and send all of them to the uh, model server. And our team uh, actually owns the uh, model serving infrastructure, which is the, the info we build first. Um, and as we see, actually, there's a, there might, uh, some uh, switching between like data scientists and product team. And especially for this task, um, we really actually don't need product team to do edge work. Actually, uh, uh, we can build a shared infrastructure um, to help simplify the process so that their scientists would manage in the, the core logic while the platform would in, be in charge of the reliability and scalability. And that's uh, why we start to look into the feature store and specifically FIST. Um, we actually investigate a couple of options, um, both commercial and open source. Um, we, we decide that uh, FIST uh, actually uh, is the most compatible with our internal test deck. And it is uh, so modular so that we can just take some of the component out. And specifically, <clears throat> so what we do is we take out the FIST core and the FIST online serving, and we deploy as it is. So just some kind of environmental variable changes, nothing, nothing more. So just deploy as it is. And we actually need to rewrite all the batch injection part. Uh, and the main reason is we, we manage our own Spark cluster. Uh, so we cannot uh, use uh, like the data processing services like uh, AWS EMR. So uh, we don't uh, have the luxury to use that. So we have to rewrite that part um, in PySpark. And finally, we actually um, inherited a lot of classes from the FIST SDK. Uh, it is what allows us to ingest some custom logic specific to us while we can reuse uh, most of the code. So it actually greatly reduced our uh, development time. And we, now we have the features sort up. We are uh, gradually rolling out production traffic. Now, this diagram actually uh, shows like uh, how it looks like. Um, 
uh, what we have what we have today. Yeah, so I will explain this uh, in, in more details. So the data scientist before uh, so they will first still need to do the EDA. This is not related to production. You can do it in a notebook or by some SQL query. So after you decide, um, there's a bunch of features you want to push that to production. Uh, th this is uh, uh, where it gets started. So you will first start it by writing something we call a uh, feature definition. Uh, basically, you will specify the name of the feature, uh, what's the type of the feature, and also like uh, we allow you to specify a couple of validation rules on how you validate the features. I will talk more in uh, more details later for that part. Um, after the data scientist write a definition, um, we will deploy that to um, something we call metadata store. Basically, it's a fist call. Um, and we also write some small tools to, uh, for example, we can uh, diff the, the config uh, is the locally with the config store in the meta store and show, show you some like um, what has been changed since last time. And, and by doing so, we, we block some uh, illegal actions. Like you cannot change the name of the feature. You, you have to create a new one. Uh, if you want to delete a um, feature, you have to go through the deletion process instead. Uh, and you cannot change the type uh, of the feature and you have to add description so that uh, others know what your feature is useful. And, and then data scientists will still be in charge of the feature transformation pipeline. So because they know the business logic and uh, uh, the, uh, it will generate a hive table <clears throat> which is stored all the features. Uh, but after that will be aut automated. So we have a um, airflow deck that will listen to the uh, hive table. And once that table is ready, we would uh, read the definitions. Um, actually, uh, the arrow is wrong. The definition is read from the metadata store. Um, and we would uh, validate the, the type is right. Um, we also allow downcast if, if you want to like cast your flow 64 to flow 32, we support that. We also do a bunch of validation. Uh, you have to pass those tracks before uh, really putting your data into, into the Redis. And, and then the ingestion job would automatically put the things in, into Redis and that would be made available for online serving. And then next, um, the data scientists would bring up the model server as before. Um, the only change is they can specify an additional config file. And this config file would, would allow you to say, okay, this is some feature I want to read from uh, Beast. Oh, the name is Beast because um, it's this, it is our internal project name because it's, it's built from Fist, so now it becomes Beast. Um, so we allow you to specify um, what feature you should read from Beast, and then there's some pass-through feature, basically um, something that's not available uh, immediate in the, in the feature store right now. Um, we also have some uh, front-end engineer that, that's building up the UI for uh, easier registration and discovery. Um, and one, one part I did not mention is the feature history. So originally, we, we, did, we want to maintain some copy of the feature value, but it turns out we actually uh, didn't do that. Um, one of the big reasons is we, we also do a lot of backfill. And what would happen is if you have backfill the hive table, um, you, want, you also need some way to trigger the ingestion job. They, they have to remember to do that. Uh, this might not be um, very uh, user-friendly. So we decided to just maintain some kind of um, uh, pointer uh, to point into the hive table uh, so that we can we actually construct um, uh, we can go back to the history by uh, by query instead uh, of keeping a copy yep so that's roughly how um, how the overall like architecture architecture looks like um, and I will go into a little bit deeper oh, yeah into some customization we have been, been doing uh, one I think this part is the most interesting part to me um, so due to some like internal infra constraint, we actually cannot um, do a gRPC to Java services. So we cannot deploy like just the FIST call as a pod or the FIST serving as a separate pod. So what we ultimately decided is we have, um, we pack the whole thing into a single pod um, because like FIST call is pretty lightweight. So we haven't seen any like performance issue. Um, we also have an additional layer uh, it's a we call, we call it gateway server. Basically, this server in charge of translating gRPC into REST API. Um, and we use a, a tool called gRPC Gateway 
that will allow you to generate the, the Golan code from a protobuf. Uh, and the server was written in a dream framework. Um, so by having this additional server, um, we certainly like if you have large data, you might see some performance uh, degradation, uh, but it's still fine for online serving. Um, and this also allows us to add like additional logging, monitoring, and, uh, and the server would also check the, the health of the two uh, trial process. And next, um, I was going to talk about the validation rules, um, as just I mentioned. So we have a bunch of validation rules to help you validate at like, for example, feature level. Um, so you can specify like, uh, uh, for this particular feature, we don't expect um, the null ratio to be is the 20%. Um, and we will check that before uh, every ingestion. Um, and we also have a capability to kind of look back in for the past few days partition so that we can say, um, if there's some changing in the null ratio, we, we also want to block that and uh, investigate a little bit more. And this is something at feature level. Uh, we also have something at the feature table level. Uh, a typical one would be the row count. So we want to guarantee some like lower bound and upper bound uh, of the, the rows stored in the hive table. So this would guarantee, uh, for example, if there's some bad table generated, um, you can capture it earlier on. And also uh, the upper bound can serve as um, a, a safeguard um, so we can uh, estimate the storage right before the ingestion. Um, that can also give us some alert on like, we should scale up the Redis uh, cluster storage or we, we should scale up the node. So that's something um, very uh, important. And user, uh, how user would use that is, um, they would do that in the future definition. Um, if you're familiar with uh, FIS SDK, you, you actually see something like um, how you define a fe uh, feature object. Um, you have the name, the type, uh, these are all the same. We just have something in additional, like we allow uh, uh, validation rules. Um, this would actually store inside um, uh, the metadata field in the proto. Yeah, so we also have a bunch of like uh, new proto buff defining. Uh, we call it like fees extended. So it's an extended proto, which uh, we will pack all this proto uh, into the metadata field uh, for storage purpose. And then finally, um, we are, uh, I want to also talk about where we are going. Um, the historical storage part um, is, a, uh, as I mentioned, maybe it's not strictly needed, um, but this is, uh, would be still useful for those locking based feature, <clears throat> meaning like, uh, you can lock the feature at model inference time, and then you can reuse. If you want to reuse that feature back, um, we certainly need some storage solution for that. Um, we are also do doing some customization. Uh, for example, we, are, we want to have some search endpoint uh, so that we, I can match the keyword uh, to the description. Um, so that, um, and it, this will support the UI for, <clears throat> um, for a better search experience. Uh, we are also discussing streaming feature support, but it, it will not come soon uh, yet. Um, and we're also trying to explore some other storage options like DynamoDB um, for online serving. Um, and lastly, um, I think we are also have idea like, uh, because we, now we have a, a pod storing the gateway server and some other Java process, uh, we are seeing we, we might need to customize some code in the Java part. Um, which, which this part can be written in, uh, in the Golan, but we're still uh, debating on um, how much effort we, are, we should uh, spend on this uh, because we have a um, very good relationship with the FIS community. We, we have a very good experience working with them. So rewriting seems to be a very costly operation uh, to us. Yeah, and this is concludes like um, uh, some future plans for, uh, for us. Um, and finally, yeah, we still have enough time uh, for Q and A's um, to see if there's any questions. Um, but before we go to Q and A, I also want to mention uh, my team is hiring. So if you're interested in um, building serving stack, training stack, um, so anything related to machine learning infra, uh, feel free to talk to me uh, over Slack. Yeah, that's all I have. So I, I can jump on and ask you a few that I'm seeing coming through in the chat on Slack. And one is which feature of, which version of Feast are you using? 
Yeah, we are still on uh, 0 0.9.4. So we have an upgrade to, to 1.x. Yeah. All right. And how is the learning curve for Feast? Yeah, I would say so far, um, let me go back to the diagram. I, I think we, <clears throat> we have a pretty good experience using Feast. Um, specifically, I think it's the, <clears throat> the modularity. So we can take out some component and we don't need to adopt all of them. And I think William is always there um, to help. And I think I really appreciate his insight on, on this. Um, certainly very good experience working with this. All right. And what happens when feature validation fails, alert, drop data, fail ingestion, or materialization? Yeah. So if the validation fail, um, we would just block the whole ingestion job uh, at that time and uh, pin on call to kind of investigate gay why. Because um, so even you have the validation, um, it, it still can, does not guarantee your, your feature is good. Um, so, but the validation is something like the, uh, the bottom line. So you have to pass the validation. And if there's some additional problems, um, we, we need to add like additional like monitoring uh, in the serving, after the serving to, to capture. Sweet. There's some good questions coming through here. So I'm going to take a little bit longer and this might be the last one or second to last one. How many data features do you use for offline and online? Can you provide information about performance for offline and online parts? Yeah. Um, so right now I would say we have a few uh, hundred features um, supporting uh, uh, like 10, 10 models roughly at the desk scale. Um, we are, um, for the performance wise, our measurement would be like, um, if you want to read 400 features, uh, double features, um, we are seeing P99 at around like 20 milliseconds. Um, so that's something we, we are seeing. I mean, for, for a single, for example, a single entity ID or a single user ID, if, if you call it. Um, for the ingestion part, we are seeing around like, um, let's see, around like, let's say we can say 10 million rows um, with a hundred features that, that can be done in one hour. So uh, we don't have very strict uh, time in the ingestion part, but uh, it certainly missed our need, especially for the ingestion part, we, uh, we actually write it ourselves. Um, so yeah, one interesting aspect I didn't mention is, um, let me go back a little bit. Um, it's actually the ingestion job um, because like data, for data scientists, what they want is, I want, the date, I want the feature into the uh, Redis as soon as possible. I, I want to like turn up infinity resource to make sure it, it, it just go into Redis, but that's very dangerous. Uh, it would occupy a lot of CPU resources um, and that would affect your read. Um, so what we do is we actually do quite aggressive uh, throttling uh, and we limit the job concurrency and the resources uh, that you can use for, for the ingestion. So that we uh, we add more security to the uh, to the Redis cluster. Yeah. 